Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Thomas and uh, Ali for this kind invitation and the organizers of this Endno Submit uh, for giving me this opportunity to start with this uh, initial lecture, 30 years of ERCP and what comes next, which also means that I'm quite old and I've seen everything through uh, over the last few years and therefore I can then give you an uh, overview of what is happening. So the first ERCPs were done in 1968 by a surgeon in Washington, William McCune. And you can see that uh, these were very crude, the pictures were very uh, different. It actually took him uh, almost four hours to do the cannulation of the first papilla and then of course soon he gave it up. Subsequently in 1970, Itoi who was a Japanese uh, house surgeon, a student at that time, uh, actually he got a special uh, scope manufactured for him by the manufacturers in Japan and started doing ERCP and in fact uh, in the World Congress he demonstrated this first in 1970 uh, and subsequently published it in endoscopy and uh, it was then shown that you can actually consistently cannulate the ampulla and fill the pancreatic and the uh, bile duct. Uh, the term ERCP was actually coined by Peter Cotton in 1972 in an article in Lancet and uh, it, you can see that uh, the title of the article was Cannulation of Papilla of Water. In fact, uh, this would never get into even a, a general uh, journal nowadays. So this was the first uh, um, terminology that was coined, ERCP, Endoscopic Retrograde Cholangiopancreatography. The first spintrotomy was done in 1973 and uh, this was actually reported simultaneously from Japan and uh, Germany, Klassen and Dembling, and of course Kawai and uh, Nagachima. In fact, uh, the first uh, cases were actually doctors themselves and Kawai himself never did the ERCP. In fact, uh, he was, uh, uh, we were told that Kawai uh, didn't do ERCP at all, it was Nagachima or did it, but because of the hierarchy system in Japan, Kawai's name came first, so we remember him in that. Uh, Klassen and Dembling, of course, uh, there was a controversy or who did the uh, actual ERCP and I think uh, Thomas would know about this better. The room was locked so we still don't know but I did ask Klassen once and he told me that he actually did the first endoscopic spintrotomy. Uh, and uh, this was actually a slide that I got from Klassen when he was arrived. You can see this was a nurse working in his unit who actually had an impacted stone in the lower end of the CBD. He did a spintrotomy, removed this uh, stone and you can see even seven years later the uh, papilla is still very open. Uh, this was the first case from Japan and this was again a medical student uh, in whom Nagachima did the first ERCP and the stone impacted. In both these cases, they didn't have baskets of balloons, they did just a spintrotomy and the stone uh, fortunately spontaneously slipped out. The first live demo of ERCP was done in 1973 and this is the group which actually did this and you can see Peter Cotton, Hoi, Klassen in this very classic picture. Uh, in fact, uh, this was uh, a, a very crude type of demonstration because they didn't have all the cameras and all that we have now. Uh, the first biliary stenting was done in 1979 by Lipsohendra. And you can actually see this uh, was actually a very thin seven French stent in a patient who had obstructive jaundice due to a malignant obstruction. And in fact, what Nib actually did was he used a nasobiliary tube that we're using later cut the tip of the tubing and that became actually a stent. Um, the first needle knife was spintrotomy and technique of this was demonstrated by Case Ubriski. In fact, Case was probably one of the best ERCPs at that time. He would get through even very difficult papillas very easily with very least movements. In fact, he was the one who showed that the economy of movements are very import important in ERCP. And you can see that he was the one who started using needle knife and showed very elegantly the use of needle knife in difficult cases where we can't get into. Uh, all the pioneers of ERCP you see here in 1970s. In fact, at that time, ERCP spintrotomy was quite a difficult procedure considering that uh, it had some complications and the surgeons were almost were against it. In fact, you can see Claude Ligary here who was one of the first to do ERCP spintrotomy in France in 1974. After he did his first spintrotomy, his uh, director of the hospital called him into his room and told him that he has to quit his job because he's just done a very dangerous procedure which the surgeons uh, uh, were complaining against and in fact he went into private practice since then. Uh, 
But you can see all the pioneers here who have worked very hard uh, to establish this whole technique of uh, ERCP and its uh, consequences. <coughs> ERCP in 1975, the first five years was a purely diagnostic procedure. We no longer, of course, do diagnostic ERCP. From 80s, we started uh, doing therapeutic and since strengthening and all started. In the next five years, we got the definition for various ERCP procedures. And again, uh, ERCP really became mature in the 90s when the cost benefit ratio of the procedures were calculated uh, along with uh, what was happening in other modalities. Quality and quality metrics came in uh, 2000. And of course, since 2000, there have been several randomized control studies. Till then, we didn't have many studies, but only then that we started getting many randomized control studies comparing ERCP within themselves and ERCP to other studies to show the superiority. Of course, this is actually not very easy to do, randomized control trials with ERCP because of oper oper operator variability and so on. If you look at the endoscopic literature, it's, uh, this is what happens, especially with ERCP, is that most of the innovations came in 1970s, but in the form of case reports. RCTs came much later on. And you can see the innovations that came uh, in 70s when uh, ERCP was still very early. And then, of course, came the innovations much later. And uh, most of the RCTs were done, as you can see, uh, came in much later when you compare to say what happened in medicine or even gastroenterology. The first RCT in gastroenterology was in 1955. And the reason why it's difficult to do these type of studies in ERCP is that uh, you have, of course, uh, difficult uh, procedures. You have different operator expertise. You also have uh, a difficulty in terms of comparing apples and oranges, two different groups. And that's the reason why you can see this was the NIH uh, review, which was done several years back. They looked at 22 years of ERCP and found that only 19% of the articles which were published were suitable for review of evidence. And this is something I think that we have to keep in mind. And of course, Thomas would agree with this. And this is clearly uh, illustrated by what happened when you're doing, e when the first reports of uh, ERCP for biliary pancreatitis came. And you can see that there were many, many studies, each of them giving different types of results. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, all were different because there were different timings, different exclusion criteria, different expert endoscopy ex expertise and so on. So this typically shows the difficulty we have in research methodology in ERCP and why we can't publish uh, very high level articles. Um, what you, if you look at what is happening in ERCP, we have this 10-year interval, the first ERCP in 1970s, the first plastic stents in 1980, the first self-expanding metal stents in 1990, covered stents 200, and the first cholangioscopies in 2010. And of course, beyond this, we look forward to what's happening every 10 years. ERCP, of course, has become much easier now. We have uh, uh, newer axeries, we have uh, uh, slippery guide wires, we have intelligent cautries, clever splinter tomes. So overall, when you look at what happened when we started ERCPs in 1980s to now, there's a dramatic difference. ERCP certainly has become a child's play now. But even then, I think one should be aware of the problems that one can come across. And this is an example of one of the first ERCPs that I did in 1980s. And uh, this was a large stone impacted, just like the stone that we're demonstrating in the live case uh, just before this lecture. This was a stone. At this time, we didn't have phalangioscopes. We didn't have even um, stone crushers. This was a basket. The basket got impacted. The patient had to go for surgery with the endoscope inside. So it was very uh, difficult movement for me at that point of time because we didn't have the mechanical crushers. Uh, I stopped doing ERC for the next six months till we got our emergency mechanical lithotripsy. Uh, which could then be used in situations like this to crush the stones. <clears throat> of course, now even difficult CBD stones have become very easy with uh, uh, balloon spintrotomies that we can do, uh, with the crushers that we have, the cholangioscopes we have for laser and so on. Uh, compared to what happened 15 to 20 years back, certainly removing difficult CBD stones is no longer difficult. Similarly, with pancreatic calicula, you can see an impacted pancreatic kidney. This is a very historical slide. In fact, Michelle Kramer gave it to me. It was the first uh, pancreatic endotherapy they did, the stone is impacted here and could not be extracted. 
uh, they did a spintrotomy and the stone spontaneously slipped out. And since then, of course, with a combination of extracorporeal shock polythetrypsy and ERCP, uh, even very difficult pancreatic stones can now be removed easily. The first metal stent was actually reported in 1983 by Krimberger. And you can see this was a very dangerous looking stent. In fact, this was a stent that they used. Uh, this was a coil actually uh, could get stuck into the mucosa here. It was actually a little risky because of this. But anyway, this was the first report. And since then, of course, uh, there's been a dramatic improvement in technology. You have these very good self-expandable metal stents, uh, stents which uh, have come with uh, mainly nitinol, but the covered stents, uncovered stents, and you have coated stents and so on. I think the whole technology is exploded so much so that we now are starting to use these metal stents even for very terminally ill patients who were being treated with plastic stents earlier are now being treated with metal stents. And even for benign disease, it's all self covered, self expanding metal stents now. So, therefore, I think uh, plastic stents are slowly going into the history of uh, ERCP museums and they're being replaced by the newer self expanding metal stents whose uh, indications are increasing dramatically over periods of time. And we also realize that. ERCP requires aids of other investigations before we can do a proper job. And this is typically uh, shown here, the hilar tumors. We never do an ERCP in a hilar tumor uh, without actually getting an MRCP done to have a GPS or a roadmap. Only then we can use this to put in, say in this case, for example, this patient required drainage of both the sites. Uh, in addition to just doing palliative therapy, we have now gone beyond that we also start doing adjuvant therapy in these patients. And this is an example of a cholangiocarcinoma, which is being treated with uh, radiofrequency ablation. Uh, and then as metal stent is put in these patients. And we find now there are also randomized control studies to suggest that using radiofrequency ablation along with stenting can prolong stent patency and also can prolong survival in these patients. And this is an example of a study from China which showed that stent patency and stent survival was prolonged by using RFA. Diagnostic ERCP, which was at the peak in 1992, as you can see, is completely gone now. And this is symbolized by Peter Cotton's broken car, a photo of which I got from Lars. And I think when diagnostic ERCP is from the past, we no longer do it. And this is because uh, the death knell of ERCP is because of better MRCP, non-invasive techniques, and of course, endoscopic ultrasound. So very, very rarely we require to do this. Uh, the reason why we should not do this, of course, is because of the potential complications of um, uh, ERCP. And uh, this was brought to attention in 1996 by this very nice uh, article from uh, uh, Marty Freeman, which showed very clearly that there can be several complications. The most dangerous and most common of this is pancreatitis, hemorrhage, perforation, and so on. And one of the things which has happened over the last uh, a uh, few years is that we're not now able to better define these complications. We know what are the risk factors for these complications, especially for post ERCP pancreatitis. We know that uh, in a patient with a suspected SOD, younger age, female, normal LFTs, if we do an ERCP, the chance of producing pancreatitis is very high. All this has resulted in better selection of the patients, decreasing the incidence of post ERCP pancreatitis. Not only this, I think we also know which patients to avoid. And typically, I think this episode uh, study has demonstrated that in patients with so-called uh, uh, bilirubin uh, spintrophody manometry type 3 especially, uh, one should be very careful because the chance of post-ERCP pancreatitis is very high. And we no longer do ERCP in these patients. Uh, if you look at what's happening in terms of diagnostic versus therapeutic ERCP, you can see that uh, over the period of time, diagnostic ERCPs have dramatically come down. Therapeutic ERCPs are increasing. Uh, the total number of ERCPs have remained static. In fact, ERCP is one area which has not progressed dramatically compared to what is happening in endoscopic ultrasound and so on. But certainly, we're getting better in terms of preventing complications. Uh, the use of rectal endomethacin, prophylactic pancreatic stents, and IV hydration has also resulted in the post-ERCP pancreatitis incidence coming down dramatically in most of the units. And I think this is one of the major advances that have occurred over the last 30 years. In, in a patient like this, for example, this was a patient who had colidocal viruses. We did a spintrotomy and we tried to remove the stones with a balloon. And look what happened. There's a profuse bleeding that occurred secondary to that. And this bleeding um, was um, so profuse that we didn't have time to do anything else but just uh, 
Uh, to control this, we had to put in a completely covered self-expanding metal stents. And you can see this uh, stent immediately stops the bleed. I think this is a very important point to emphasize. The lesson, the most important lesson that we learned over the last 30 years is ERCP is most dangerous for those who need it less. And it should not be done unless it is strongly indicated. Uh, coming to further advance in ERCP, this is a very, very old uh, um, uh, video that I got from Horst. I think, uh, again, Thomas would recognize this. Uh, 1988 it was, and you can see that uh, uh, mother baby scope was available at that point of time. And you can see uh, Hagen, Professor Hagen Muller doing this uh, along, assisted by Horst Newhouse. And you can see this is actually uh, a technique which came so many years back. It, it took so many years to get better. And this was a um, couple of years back in our hospital. You can see a little older host actually demonstrating the procedure using this uh, newer technology, the cholangioscopy using a spice scope. So technology has advanced dramatically in this area. And now we have the single op operator cholangioscope, which dramatically changes how we practice uh, the art of ERCP. And you can see this is an example of a patient Two patients having obstructive jaundice, mid CBD obstruction, lower CBD obstruction. Uh, the causes are not known, but when we did a cholangioscopy, you can see very clearly, and of course, you've seen this example in the live demonstration earlier. This was actually a mass like lesion, and this was caseous material coming out from this uh, obstruction. This turned out to be actually tuberculosis, and this mass lesion on biopsies turned out to be a lymphoma. Both of them could be treated medically without the need for any surgical intervention. I think this is one of the areas of, I think, very dramatic progression that we had. When we can't get an access to the papilla because of uh, either surgery or because of pyloric obstruction and so on, in these cases, uh, earlier we used to go do a percutaneous technique and do what is called the PTBD to try and uh, enter the billing system. This has now changed. I think endoscopic ultrasound is slowly replacing uh, the percutaneous techniques and there are of course um, many randomized studies that are ongoing comparing PTBD versus endoscopic ultrasound and the consensus seems to be that endoscopic ultrasound intervention in patients who have an obstruction uh, endoscopic ultrasound is better than PTBD because of a variety of lesions variety of reasons including you can do it in the same sitting in the endoscopy room and so on so biliary drainage is now being taken over by endoscopic ultrasound. And this is a challenge to ERCP, either hepatico, uh, through, through the stomach, gastrostomy, or cholidocoduodenostomy. Uh, so there is now a debate whether US could replace ERCP, even for primary drainage, even if we have access to the papilla. And this was a paper from Shams Group uh, from US, which actually looked at this, and they published a randomized trial which showed that doing uh, an uh, endoscopic ultrasound is um, superior to ERCP even in an accessible papilla in terms of reduced amount of complications like pancreatitis. But I think this is a controversial pro point which a uh, Korean group has also demonstrated as safety. But I would say that we should wait. ERCP is still the primary modality of therapy for obstructive jaundice, especially when you have an accessible papilla. If you don't have an accessible papilla, of course, you can go to US, but I think still right, right on the standard of care is still ERCP. Now, what are the future directions that it can go to ERCP? Just to give you again a bird's eye view of what's happening. There are problems with the altered anatomy doing ERCP and uh, especially a large number of patients are now undergoing bariatric surgery. Uh, in these cases, uh, entroscopic assisted ERCP, lap assisted ERCP, or uh, US guided gastropexy followed by ERCP are uh, alternatives that we are doing in these patients. Enteroscopic assisted ERCP is another whole area of uh, discussion, and this is uh, something that can be done, but again, we don't have proper axillaries for this and requires to be developed further. Um, Another, especially when patients are undergoing bariatric surgery, when you have a stomach which is separated from the stump, you can actually put a self-expanding uh, metal stent and then go through this to do the ERCP. Of course, you can approach it through a uh, laparoscopic approach also, but uh, one of the things, with whichever is being done in a unit should be normally done. Uh, the other problem that came up with ERCP over the last few years is the incidence of CRE. Uh, the infection rates, which can be very difficult to control with significant mortality. The cause for this uh, CRE infections is because of the complex tip at the end of the scope, which is difficult to uh, clean. 
And therefore, the concept of disposable deodonoscope, I think right now we already have Boston Scientific, which is excellent deodonoscope available in US and uh, here in India. Uh, this is another concept. The problem, of course, is the cost. Other companies are also coming up with single-use deodonoscope. Uh, I think the use of single-use deodonoscope is going to be in certain circumstances only because the cost in uh, units which don't have much ERCP expertise, very small volume can invest in this or those where ERCP has to be done in patients already with multi-resistant organisms or intensive care setting, we can use this. The other areas of progress are going to be in areas where axils are going to change. And this is an example of biodegradable stents that are going to come in. We started using this not only in the biliary system, but also in the pancreatic system for prophylaxis. <laughs> Ultimately, I think what is going to happen is we are going to get a scope where you can actually combine endoscopic ultrasound with ERCP because in pancreatic or biliary, therapeutic endoscopy, both are becoming equally important and very often you require both of them. Instead of using two scopes, I think manufacturers are already looking at it where they can have one scope where you can do an endoscopic uh, ultrasound and change this into an ERCP scope. And finally, what is going to happen in future and future in the future for what is going to happen. This may not be immediate future for many of you. Some of us own this, but certainly there is a chance that this could occur. This is a world cup abdominal pain. He takes a pill which is actually But the thought today is to scan. Actually, we should take it in the capsule and just go to the inside and tell the doctor who could be watching his food with a gastric problem like that. My broadband platform. He's taken time to ask for his time to come to the hospital. I think he's going to tell the doctor who could be watching his food with a gastric problem like that. He doesn't have to actually get up and then he opens the capsule and the small bubble comes inside. It breaks the capsule up and then file uh, And uh, of course, using the system techniques and technology, you have to get it thrown off. This is the most important part. Uh, the gas controllers can go back to the hospital with the system. So this is a technology that we may not uh, uh, see in our lifetime, but certainly there's potential for this because all these technologies are available and uh, this type of track. And finally, I think um, ERCP or establishing a ERCP unit is a teamwork which requires uh, um, a team of not only endoscopists, but also technicians, nurses, administrators, and so on. The goal, of course, is to not only succeed, but make it very safe for the patient. And over 30 years, we have seen dramatic improvements that have occurred in techniques, technology, and safety, and of course, success rates. But we should also be aware that alternative techniques are coming, and ERCP is going to be confined to a very small niche area uh, where it's going to help our patients. Thank you very much.